Hi friends, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Erin and if this is your first time here, welcome to Booked and Busy. Today's video is going to be like another spring book haul, but really it's my March and April book haul. Uh, but before we get into the book haul, I do want to thank the sponsor of today's video and that is Teddy Blake. So if you remember a few months ago, I hauled a bag that Teddy Blake had sent to me. Um, they asked me if I wanted to receive a bag for in exchange for an honest review. I unboxed it and it was stunning. So here is the bag right here um i've been wearing this bag literally every single day since it was sent to me um it's perfect for all the things that i do i take it to the club with me when i'm out and i'm dressed up i take it out with me when i'm running errands and i'm wearing sweats and just being casual it is the perfect everyday bag it's big enough to hold all of my stuff um so i have lots of things in here and one of my favorite things is that it has this built-in little pouch. So in here, I can keep things that I reach for quickly. So like my wallet, um, uh, my Metro card, my keys, all the things that I need for easy access to. And I'm able to cinch it up and make this part really small. But if I need to like get in there, put something larger in there, I can loosen it up and make a much bigger section. So it's been two or three months that I've had this bag wearing it every single day. And it still looks just as good as it does the day that I first unboxed it. Um, right now we are heading into Mother's Day. It's only like two weeks away. So Teddy Blake is having an amazing sale of up to 75% off their bags. If you look at their website, you will see that they have a plethora of bags from size and style. And and it is a more affordable luxury brand they have italian leather these amazing manufacturers there's something for everyone so if you like a big bag i use them a big bag girl you can find something that you can put your whole life in if you want something dainty and cute something for every day something just to spice it up on date nights they have something for everyone um i highly recommend it i think i'm probably gonna get something for myself you know I might throw in a little something something for my mother as well just because it is such a good bag and it's black but i do want to have something for like when i'm wearing lighter colors or when i'm wearing brown maybe something a little bit bigger um, but i really recommend them um i loved carrying my bag and so many compliments on it all the time and with this one specifically i got one with a thicker strap so that it's not cutting into my shoulder so as you can see it sits really well on my shoulder and I'm able to wear it with no discomfort even when I have it full to the brim. So I will leave a link to Teddy Blake's website in the description of this video if you're interested in checking them out. I'll also leave a link to the specific bag that I have. Um, so yeah, let's get into the book haul. And once again, I want to thank Teddy Blake for sponsoring today's video. The first couple books that I want to talk about are some special editions. So this is the March uh, Adult Fairy Loot and the March Young Adult Fairy Loot. So for March Young Adult, the theme was Threads of Fate and the book was The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea by XCO. This is a standalone YA fantasy that is a retelling of Korean myth about this young woman who goes beneath the sea to become the bride of the god of the sea and try to save the world in the process. And the March adult fairy loop is the TikTok sensation, The Atlas Six by Olive Blake. The first book in, I'm not sure what the name of this series is, but uh, I own the like regular edition of this that I bought like when it was still Indie Pub um, or Self Pub, excuse me. But this edition is so, so pretty. I did not like do an unboxing for this because it's just one book, but it does have this really pretty sprayed edge detail and these gorgeous in papers and it is signed so i'm excited to finally read this one i decided to go ahead and wait until i got the finished copy because i know there are lots of changes made and a bit more explanations given to some of the things so i'm looking forward to reading this one pretty soon next one i only picked up one of the next two like categories of genres so i thought i'd put them together the first is a romance so i picked up the air by sophie lark this is a self-published romance and it is boffy romance and this is the first book in the kingmaker series kingmakers is like uh mafia boarding school academy where you go to become mafiosos and there are like four paths that you can take i think it's accountants spies assassins and something else um and this is the first so this these follow some of the children of the first series of hers which is the brutal birthright but i this one sounded a little bit more interesting to me um so i picked this one up first so i'm excited to to get into miss lark because the girlies love her um, nonfiction, y'all know I've been in my nonfiction bag more recently, but I only picked up one in this particular haul, I think, that I can put my eyes on. 
So we're just gonna go, yeah. And so that is Bad Flat Girl, Bad Fat Black Girl Notes from a Trap Feminist by Cecily Bowen. I've heard really good things about this and it, it, it talks about womanism and modern feminism and the way feminism really looks for black women and, and the intersections between those things. This one isn't very long and I know that the audiobook is narrated by the author herself. Um, and I'm just excited to get into this because I'm, you know, I am a bad fat black girl and I am trying to learn more about feminism. I don't necessarily identify as a feminist, but I'm excited to read more literature. I've been on a journey of reading more feminist literature um, more recently. So those are my special editions and romance nonfiction. When Mina was here, we took a visit to my favorite used bookstores. I picked up a couple books from there, so I have them all like in one category. The first one that I picked up is for me, a future vlog where I'm going to be reading my bestie's favorite book. And his favorite book is The Fourth K by Mario Puzo. Give, this gives me like uh, London Has Fallen, Angel Has Fallen, those Gerard Butler movies. Like a, a James Patterson or a um, Robert Langdon type of book. And it's about Kennedy who's been like, elected president and uh he's haunted by this legacy of tragedy and now a world leader has been assassinated and the president's daughter has been kidnapped and uh someone has to solve the mystery so i have this like beat up copy because this is like the cover that he read so i'm excited to be you know as authentic as possible um i also picked up city of brass by edward d hawk this is um, an occult Simon Arc story is about this small upstate New York town that's controlled by the Bain family, the founders of Bain Brass, and then a young woman is murdered and there seems to be a link between her and the Bains. And so our detective guy is going to solve it. Very old school. Next up, I picked up The Story Life of A.J. Fickery by Gabrielle or Gabriel Zevin. This one is a book about books. It's kind of all I really know about it. It says, A.J. Fickery's life is not at all what he expected it to be. He lives alone. His bookstore is experiencing the worst sales in its history. And now his prized possession, a rare collection of Poe poems, have been stolen. But when a mysterious package appears at the bookstore, it is unexpected arrival gives Fickery the chance to make his life over and see everything anew. It has humor, romance, and a touch of suspense. And I picked this up because it sounds similar to another book that I'm going to show you that I loved. So, well, since we're into that one, this is like the, my most darling find of the used book story, and that is A Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon, which the story of AJ Fickery reminded me of this one, which is why I picked it up. I am so excited to reread this. Um, just look at that. It looks like an old book. This is one of my favorite books, actually. Um, I read it in 2020. And I think about it so often. And this is this book about this young man named Daniel. Him and his father, they own a bookstore and they run it. And his father takes him to the Cemetery of Forgotten Books. And um, he claims a book and that book kind of becomes his own. He reads it and it's like the best thing he's ever read. And he tries to find out more, find more works by this author. And then he finds out that someone is systematically destroying every copy of this book. And he might be next. Him and his copy might be next. And this is 1940s Spain. The audiobook is is fantastic like this story honestly like y'all read this this is so it's not under hyped because it's a very popular book but it's a book that i personally don't talk about enough is with given how much i love it the last thing i picked up is the only good indians by stephen graham jones this is an adult horror um i've heard really great things about this one i know that it has to do with like some elk some people who haunt, hunted some like sacred elk and uh there might be a little bit of like vigilante justice going on here it's compared to get out um so i'm intrigued to see how i feel about this but i have heard mostly great things so next we're gonna get into the fantasy books that i purchased myself as well as the classic collection so for the collection, I have been collecting the Penguin Galaxy collection. Um, they're only of like classic sci-fi fantasy tales. There are only six of them and I have three and then I purchased two more. So now I have five out of the six. So the first one that I picked up is Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. All these have an introduction by Neil Gaiman. Um, Stranger in a Strange Land is... Um, this is a human race on Mars. Valentine Michael Smith has just arrived on planet Earth among his people for the first time. He struggles to understand the social mores and prejudices of human nature that are so alien to him. While his own psi powers among them 
telepathy, clairvoyance, telekinesis, and teleportation, they became a type of messiah figure among humans. Stranger in a Strange Land grew from a cult favorite to a bestseller to a classic in a few short years. The story of the man from Mars who taught humankind grokking and water sharing and love. It is his masterpiece. So I'm excited. I enjoy classic sci-fi. When I started reading sci-fi back in summer 2020, I started with the classics. I started with Arthur C. Clarke, and I'm ready to get back to those roots. In that same vein, I picked up Neuromancer by William Gibson. This one, I know nothing about this one. It says, before the internet was commonplace, William Gibson showed us the matrix, a world within the world, the representation of every byte of data in cyberspace. Henry Dorset Case was the sharpest data thief in the matrix until an ex-employer crippled his nervous system. Now a new employer has recruited him for a last chance run against an unthinkably powerful artificial intelligence. With a mirror-eyed girl, street samurai riding shotgun, he's ready for the silicone quick, bleaky, prophetic adventure that upped the ante on the entire genre of fiction. Hmm. I've never seen the Matrix movies, so maybe I'll read those and read this and watch those and see if they have like similar vibes. Or maybe this was like those were inspired by this. I don't know. Um, the next two are two new fantasy releases that I picked up myself. The first is Skyward Flight by Brandon Sanderson and Jamesy Patterson. These are a collection of three novellas that were released around the time of Cytonic. So the first two, Sunreach and Redon, were released prior to Cytonic and are to be read before Cytonic. And the last one is Evershore, which is to be read after Cytonic. So, um, of course, Brandon Sanderson writes three novellas and it's like over 600 pages. But I'm excited. I have not yet read Cytonic, um, so I'm probably going to be reading these and that pretty soon. Uh, and Cytonic is like his YA sci-fi series about this young girl. Uh, who wants to be a fighter pilot but her father was a traitor and it makes it really difficult for her family and so she has to fight against the powers that be to become a fighter pilot and also i picked up the blood trials by e nia or ne davenport this was a book that was not on my radar until a couple people read it and they told me how bloody and gory and violent it was and they're like aaron you're gonna love this because y'all know i love blood and guts so i'm really excited to get into this one this one has blood magic um, and it's about this world where the emperor has been killed and his granddaughter, I cannot, excuse me, the commander has been killed and his granddaughter knows that the only thing who, that could have killed her is this famous emperor or someone from the guard and only someone in the highest level of the tribunal could have issued that order. And this is her revenge story. Y'all know I love a good revenge story. It's one of my favorite things. I'm really looking forward to this because uh, black author, blood and guts, really rage, revenge. Sounds like possibly my new favorite book because you know that's how I got to Rage of Dragons. So the next section we have, the first one is kind of unlike the others, but this is like literary fiction, general, general contemporary fiction. The first one just not so much, but it doesn't fit in any other category. Okay, so the first one that I mentioned that doesn't really fit with the rest is Portrait of a Thief by Grace Deatley. I picked this up solely because Monty gave it five stars. It was his favorite book of last year, I believe, uh, and it has to do with a heist. I like a good heist. Um, there's my receipt. Uh, it says history is told by the conquerors this is oceans 11 which i love meets the farewell and portrait of a thief a lush lyrical heist novel inspired by the true story of chinese art vanishing from western museums by diaspora the colonization of art and the complexity of the chinese american identity so i've been reading more general type fiction less uh, speculative fiction let's say and this sounded intriguing i really like the cover blue and yellow combo on colors really pulls me in so i'm excited to get to this one Next up, we have like a hard-hitting contemporary, and that is My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. Um, Mina read this one recently, and she was so filled with emotion reading it. She wanted to literally climb into the book and fight someone, and I like feeling really strong emotions from books. I've heard this book is really hard-hitting, and is really difficult to read, and it's really like physically upsetting, and I love that. I want that experience for me. I do know that this is a pretty heavy topic. It is about this young woman who... Um, was in a inappropriate relationship with a teacher when she was in school and then years later it has come out uh, and there are multiple people coming forward about him having inappropriate relationships with them except that she thinks that they were in a real relationship she does not believe that she was being assaulted or groomed or anything like that and so we're grappling with that um this is a pretty short one but i know that when it came out it was making around the people were like disgusted with it and i enjoyed being disgusted next one i picked up mainly like the cover is what drew me in now it sounds interesting but like the cover we talked about colors that pull me in this blue white orange mosaic situation this is still life by sarah winman so this one 
is Tuscany 1944. This could have gone in the historical fiction section, but it's okay. Uh, as Allied troops advance and bombs fall around deserted villages, a young English soldier finds himself in the wine cellar of an abandoned villa. There he has a chance encounter uh, with a middle-aged art historian who has come to Italy to salvage paintings from the ruins and recall long-forgotten memories of her own youth. In each other, they find a kindred spirit amongst the rubble of war-torn Italy and set off on a course of events that will shape their lives for the next four decades. As he returns home to London, re immersing himself and his crew at the Stoughton Parrot, a motley mix of pub crawls and eccentricities, he carries his time in Italy with him. And when an unexpected inheritance brings him back to where it all began, Ulysses knows better than to tempt fate and return to the Tuscan Hills. With beautiful prose, extraordinary tenderness, and bursts of humor and light, still life is a sweeping portrait of unforgettable individuals who come together to make a family and a deeply drawn celebration of beauty and love in all its forms. Doesn't that sound so good? Um, so yeah, got that one. Uh, next up, I picked up Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. I went in there, uh, I watched Encanto and it became my new personality. And I wanted to consume more Colombian media. And so with literature, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is like the, I don't know if forefather is the correct term, but he's extremely well-regarded Colombian artist, uh, writer. Uh, he's won the Nobel Prize. And this is one of his most famous works. Uh, like I said, I was looking for Love in a Time of Cholera, but this one sounds really good. It is a story of the rise and fall, birth and death of the myth mythical town of Macondo through the history of the Bundia family. Doesn't this sound similar? Yeah. Inventive, amusing, magnetic, sad, and alive with unforgettable men and women, brim brimming with truth, compassion, and a lyrical magic that strikes the soul. This novel is a masterpiece in the art of fiction. So I'm really excited to get into this one. And after I read that one, I'll probably read more of his work. Next up, another new release that I know nothing about, but I'm intrigued by. It. That is A Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. These, I bought this and uh, Portrait of a Thief together. They were on a little bundle. Um, so this one, a novel of art, time, love, and plague that takes the reader from Vancouver Island in 1912 to a dark colony on the moon nearly 500 years later, unfurling a story of humanity across centuries and space. So we're going to span 500-ish years in this little bitty book. I've never read anything from Emily St. John Mandel, but I do own Station Eleven, which I also want to read, so maybe um, I'll read these three pretty soon. So excited about that. Next up, uh, I, in my journey of reading more literary fiction, I uh, the prize winners or prize long listers and short list of the Women's Prize for Fiction, International Man Booker Prize, all those were announced. And one of those was The Island of Missing Trees by Elise Shafak. I have another book by this author on my TBR and that is The Architect's Apprentice, which I feel like it's gonna be a five star read. Uh, and this just sounds so good. It sounds like it's, I'm gonna be shook and shaking, like it's really gonna destroy me. Um, two teenagers, a Greek Cypriot and a Turkish Cypriot, meet at a taverna on the island they both call home. In the taverna, hidden beneath garlands of garlic, chili peppers, and creeping honeysuckle, Kostas and Daphne grow in their forbidden love for each other. A fig tree stretches through a cavity in the roof, and this tree bears witness to their hushed, happy meetings and eventually to their silent, serpentous departures. The tree is where the war breaks out. When the capital is reduced to ashes and rubble, and when the teenagers vanish, decades later, Kostas returns. He is a botanist looking for native species, but really, he's searching for lost love. Years later, a ficus carica grows in the back garden of a house in London, where Ada Kazanzakis lives. This tree is her only connection to an island she has never visited, her only connection to her family's troubled history and her complex identity, as she seeks to untangle years of secrets to find her place in the world. A moving, beautifully written and delicately constructed story of love, division, transcendence, history, and eco-consciousness. The Island of Missing Trees is Alicia Fox's best work yet. So I'm really excited. A lot of these, not a lot of these, but a couple of these were bought at the same time. Like five of these literary fiction, historical fiction were bought at the same time. So this, Love in the Time of uh, 100 Years of Solitude, Still Life, and a couple that I want to talk about in just a second were all bought at the same time. Lastly, in this category of literary fiction, but also historical fiction, we have Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. Uh, I picked this one up because I, I was interested in it. the cover sounds really intriguing the premise sounds really intriguing and I sampled the audio and I was like three percent in and I was like oh yeah this is gonna be it so this is about a pastor in the 1970s and he's married he has kids uh and he meets this woman and he's like infatuated with her and he starts like fabricating situations and like things to be around her 
um, and it is about the, the family, his wife, their children, and the different journeys that they're going on. This is actually the first book in a trilogy, and it takes a look at four vi un vivid, unforgettable characters and their keen eye take on contemporary America. Uh, it ventures back into the past and explores the history of two generations. So I am really, really excited to read this one. Uh, and as y'all can see from the haul, I'm really branching out, really getting out there. So this next stack, uh, we have some historical fiction. Some of those are historical fiction too, but alas. Also, this was in that same haul. And we have On a Night of a Thousand Stars by Andrea Yaria Clark. This one is... Uh, a moving emotional narrative of love and resilience. A young couple confronts the start of Argentina's dirty war in the 1970s and a daughter searches for truth years later. So we have things that are happening in the 70s, also a group of people in 1998, another family in 1976. Um, it speaks to relationships, morality, and identity during a brutal period in Argentinian history and the understanding and redemption people crave in the face of tragedy. So I told you I was buying books to try and film something. I was buying these books with the hopes that they were going to wreck me. And uh, here's to hoping one of them is successful. Next up, a book that I have been really, really anticipating. Uh, the cover really intrigues me. The premise really intrigues me, especially after having read um, 50 Words for Rain recently. And that is Beast of a Little Lamb by Julia Kim. This one, uh, an epic story of love, war, and redemption set against the backdrop of the Korean independence movement. So we go from 1917 and it takes us over the course of 50 years and we follow um, this family that uh, is living during the uh, Japanese occupation of Korea and we follow different members of that family uh, from a courtesan school to glamorous cafes. It unveils a world where friends become enemies, enemies become saviors, heroes are persecuted, and beasts take many shapes. Uh, Monty Ray this recently gave it four stars. I've seen nothing but glowing reviews for this one. People do say it's a little bit um, of a tearjerker sometimes, kind of emotional, and that the pacing can be a little bit odd, but I'm still really excited about that one. Next up, we have The Widow Queen by Elizabeta Cherenzinska, translated by Maya Zakrzewska Penn, I think. Um, Epic historical fiction is my jam because that's really what a lot of medieval fantasy with love magic is like. It's really just like really epic historical fiction. Fortune favors the bold. It's the earliest days of the Polish kingdom and Swislawa, daughter of the great duke, has spent her childhood learning the game of politics alongside her brother. Boleslaw the Brave. Her family sees her as a pawn in the chess game of power, but she wants to be more, a queen in her own right. The Widow Queen is an epic saga of family, love, is it raining? Oh, it's raining. And war. A battle-tested exile returns to claim his rightful throne. A bloodthirsty prince hungers for his father's crown. And an honorable Viking leads, uh, leader is thrust into the labyrinthine politics of nobility. And so Slawa holds the power to raise or ruin the face of them all. Doesn't that sound good? It sounds good, I know. And then last but not least in this section, we have Peach Blossom Spring by Melissa Fu. This is another historical fiction novel and it takes place in 1938 China. It is a moving novel about war, migration, and the power of telling stories that follows three generations of a Chinese family on their search to find a place called home. I enjoy generational stories. I enjoy following a group of people or one specific person over long swaths of time um, because you really get to see the totality of their life and their lived experience and it also has a generally like a more impactful reading experience because you're invested in these characters because you spend so long with them and you watch them grow so much so that's it for the historical fiction section next up if you have been watching my channel recently you know that i have recently been exploring the manga genre medium and so i have posted at this point three episodes of manga monday uh of the books that i have out for my library the books that i own come book shopping with me looking for some recommendations so the next section uh if you watch that video you'll be familiar with these but these are just the manga that i picked up recently and there's one comic as well all right so this is going to be a quick flyby of these manga volumes because i do have a dedicated video where i go into a bit more detail but i picked up orange the complete collection volume one I Hear the Sunspot, Volume 1, Your Name, Volume 1, Berserk, Volume 1, Spy Family, Volume 1, Watsukai, Love is Heart for an Otaku, Volume 1 and 2, Sweat and Soap, Volume 1, 
A Man and His Cat, Volume 1. A Sign of Affection, Volume 1. Full Metal Alchemist, Volume 1. And then the comic that I picked up was Saga Volume 3. As you would have heard, I am continuing my slow reread to prepare for Volume 10, which is coming out this summer. Uh, as you know, Saga has come off a three year hiatus, so I'm collecting these and rereading them because the first time I read most of them was digitally because uh, they were all like on script, I believe, or for my library. And the last stack of books that we have to talk about are books that were sent to me by the publisher. So some of these are finished copies, some of them are arts. I may have hauled one of them before. I know the other one I hauled the art, but I now have the finished copy. So let's just go over these real quick. First up, we have The Legacy of Molly Softborn by Tade Thompson. This goes, uh, this is a May arc. This is the third and final book in the Molly Southborn trilogy. First book being um, The Blood of Molly Southborn, I think. Something like that. Uh, I have not started this series actually, but this is like horror dark fantasy. So I'm excited to start this now that I have like the whole thing. And this is about a young woman who every time she bleeds, a copy of herself is created. Uh, Tor was so kind as to send me a finished copy of Season of Fears by Shana McGuire. One of my most anticipated releases, even though I have not read Middle Game yet. But Middle Game is on my April TBR, so I'm planning to get to it soon and also read and vlog this one for you all. Um, Orbit sent me The Throne of Five Winds and The Bloody Throne, which are the first and third book in the Hostage of the Empire series. Uh, it says, not all empires are one on the battlefield. So book one, we have two queens, two concubines, six princes, innumerable secret identities and agencies, uh, a single hidden blade. The emperor's palace full of ambitious royals, sly gossip, and unforeseen perils is perhaps the most dangerous place in Zayam. The lady Komor Yala has only her wits and her hidden blade to protect herself and her princess Mahara, sacrificed in marriage to the enemy, a hostage for their conquered people's good behavior to secure a tenuous peace. But the emperor is aging and the cure princess and her lady-in-waiting soon find themselves to be pawns in the six princes daily schemes for the throne and a single spark could ignite fresh rebellion in Kerr. It's the first in the Hostage of Empire series, an epic tale of power, conquest, and deadly entry. I love a good political fantasy. I love a good royal fantasy. Those things usually coincide and there seems to be rebellion and war and all those things going to happen as well. So they sent me the first and the third and I got picked up the second from my library so you probably would have seen that in my library hall. They also sent me We Cry for Blood by Devin Matson, which is the third book and I think the Reborn Empire series. The fourth book is coming out later on this year and this is a series that I plan to marathon. It is one of my like series that I want to prioritize this year so I really think I'm going to like it. These covers are stunning and the new cover is like this gorgeous purple. I'm really looking forward to getting into it. I don't want to read you the synopsis of this one because I don't want to spoil you or myself. I may have already hauled The Book of Night by Holly Black, but Tor sent me this one as well. This is Holly Black's adult fantasy debut. Uh, it has to do with like shadows and ghosts or something like that. Also from Orbit, we have The Ballad of Perilous Graves by Alex Jennings. This is a June release. Uh, and this is like an urban fantasy takes place in New Orleans. Uh, we have put on your dancing shoes and step into New Orleans as you've never seen it before in this vibrant and imaginative debut. NOLA is a city full my memory card cut off. I'm not sure where I left off, but we're just going to read that over. Nola is a city full of wonders, a place of sky trolleys and dead calves, where haints dance the night away, wise women keep the order, and songs walk, talk, and keep the spirit of the city alive. To those from away, Nola might seem strange. To failed magician Perilous Graves is simply home. Then the rhythm stutters. Nine songs of power have escaped from the magical piano that maintains the city's beat, and without them, Nola will fail. Unexpectedly, Perry and his sister Brindy are tasked with saving the city, but a storm is brewing and the haint of all haints is awake. Even if they capture the songs, Nola's time might be coming to an end. This is just so intriguing. And it came with this like map and it's just so cute. It says, welcome to Nola, the city of music, magic, and dreams. This little pamphlet, I thought that was really cute. So I'm excited for this. And this is by a black author. So we love to see it. This is Alex Kiar. So yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Red Hook, an extension of Orbit or an imprint as well. They sent me Kaikei, 
uh, by Fashionavi Patel. This is a historical fiction and it is a retelling of, I think, some type of, of the Ramayana. Another one of my most anticipated releases and I plan to get to this one soon, but this is just so pretty. Like it has these gorgeous deckled edges um, and I've been seeing stellar reviews. Uh, Jenny from This Story Ain't Over is like, this is one of her favorite books of all time, favorite books of the year. Uh, the Angela from Literature Science Alliance said it was amazing. Uh, so I'm just really, really looking forward to this one. So it says, so begins Kaikei's story. I was born on the full moon under an auspicious constellation, the holiest of positions. Much good it did me. The only daughter of the kingdom of Kakaya, she is raised on tales of the gods. How they churn the vast ocean to obtain the nectar of immortality. How they vanquish evil and ensure the land of Barad prospers. And how they offer powerful boons to the worthy. Yet she watches as her father unceremoniously banishes her mother. Listens as her own worth is reduced to the marriage alliance she can secure. And when she is called upon the gods for help, they never seem to hear. Desperate for independence, she turns to the text she once read with her mother and discovers a magic that is hers alone. With it, Kaikei transforms herself from an overlooked princess into a warrior, diplomat, and most favorite queen. But as the evil from her childhood stories threatens the cosmic order, the past she has forged clashes with the destiny the gods have chosen for her family. And Kaikei must decide if resistance is worth the destruction it will wreak and what legacy she intends to leave behind. Yeah, I'm excited, I'm excited. Last two, another one from Orbit and another one from Tor. So Tor sent me Siren Queen by Nevo. This is Nevo's uh, upcoming, I think it's a May release, yes. And then it's like old Hollywood coming of age story about a Chinese American girl from Hungarian Hill. So I'm hoping that this one is more of a hit for me than The Chosen and the Beautiful. Last but not least, another gift from Orbit and another of my most anticipated releases of the year and a book I'm currently reading, The Hunger of the Gods by John Gwynn. This is the second book in the Lord Swan Saga, the sequel to The Shadow of the Gods, um, and this picks up immediately where that book left off. This is a Norse-inspired fantasy world where gods have fallen but their bodies still have power and they are used by the people left over in the world and some of the people in the world have magic in their veins as well and those are hunted down and... Da, da, da. But I really enjoyed this one. I'm a big fan of John Gwen. Y'all know that. So I'm excited to be continuing on with this one. So this has been my March and April book haul. Uh, tell me which of these books is most interesting to you. Have I to convince you to try any of them? If you made it to the end of the video. What type of emoji are we going to do? Um. Hmm. Let's leave a crown emoji. No, 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 no. It's real springy and I still look like a cherry blossom. I was going for cherry blossom today. We're going to leave a cherry blossom. And another thank you to Teddy Blake for sponsoring this video. Make sure you check out the link to find something for yourself or for a mother in your life this holiday season. And I will see you all in my next video. Goodbye.